Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Slides and terminal. Yeah, all good. All right, cool. This should be this should be really quick. Um, I just want to give a quick overview of PSC package because it's been around for a little while. Um, I know some people have tried it out, but it hasn't got a lot of um, you know press um, in the release notes or anything like that. Uh, so just to give a quick overview and people can try it out. I'm sure most people here have probably seen a lot of what I'm going to show, but it'd be good to get you know, get it on YouTube anyway. Um, and I'll give a quick demo as well. So, okay. Uh, yeah, let's start. So uh, what is PSC package? Uh, from the repo uh, description, it's an executable which helps manage pure script dependencies using Git. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty vague, but essentially uh, the goal with PSC package is that it's supposed to be something that you could use in place of uh, Bower and Pulp if you didn't want to use, um, well, so it, it solves a couple of problems, but uh, you know, some, some people don't like to use Bower and Pulp for various reasons because they don't want to depend on Node or, you know, they want the pure, um, you know, maybe they're, they're setting up their, their setup as sort of a, you know, a pure Haskell project and, and, you know, they're just using, you know, PSC, the executable, or, you know, it's harder to set it up for their operating system or, or whatever, right? So um, it just gives an alternative, um, you know, an alternative to those existing tools that we've used in the past. Um, that's more convenient in some cases, but it depends quite a lot on, on your workflow, right? So for example, um, PSC package is already being used by some alternative backends like Pure 11 and the, the Erlang backend, I believe, because, um, you know, obviously you don't tend to use Bower when you or Node in general when you're writing, you know, C plus plus or Erlang, so it makes sense to have something shipped with the compiler that's a little more, uh, you know, backend agnostic, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the goal here is not uh, not for the compiler to uh, encourage users to use PSC package exclusively, but that the compiler uh, itself should not depend um, on Bower specifically, right? It, there should be no tie. Uh, it should be convenient to use Bower, and it should be convenient to use PSC package, but the compiler shouldn't have a preference for either one. It should just have whatever hooks and command line options are necessary to enable the user to choose whichever is more convenient. Um, so hopefully by 0.11, you know, that's going to be the case, and all of the, uh, you know, specific things, you know, that, things that specifically required Bower uh, now are just going to be, uh, you know, that you could you could use PSC package just as well. Okay. So I'm just going to go through this this quick start guide to show, uh, you know, at a high level how you would use PSC package and why it's useful. Um, so you, you can start by initializing the project. So you can say, you know, PSC package init. Uh, actually, I guess I should show uh, just quickly how you might get hold of PSC package. I think the PSC package repo, uh, you know, has the binaries like we do with the compiler. I think I set that up. But by 0.11, I'll release, you know, actual binaries. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you can always just build, uh, you know, the sort of the latest version off, uh, you know, off master by just doing stack build uh, or stack install or whatever. So I, I usually just do, um, you know, copy bin. Is this font size readable, by the way? I turn that up a little bit. That was fine. Yeah, it's okay. All right. So, so I, I just ran this and you know, I copied this PSC package executable into on you know onto my path somewhere. Um, okay. So to start, I'm just going to create. You know, a new directory inside temp. Um, PSC package example. Okay, and obviously it's empty, and I can just say PSC package init. Um, so what this is going to do is, you know, it's going to it's going to try and figure out what version of the compiler you have on your path, which in, in the example here is zero ten seven, um, and in my case over here is actually zero eleven, like you know, off of master, which is a development build. So. Um, when I run this, it's actually going to give me an error because there's no uh, there's no package set configuration for 0 0.11 yet because it hasn't been released. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll do this and then uh, I'll sort of modify the configuration to point it back at the old configuration for 0 0.10.7 so you can see the configuration and then it should work. Right? So it'll say using the default package set for 0 0.11 and then it tries to clone that from you know wherever that configuration lives. Um, and it'll say it couldn't find the branch PSC 0.11.0 uh, because I haven't created it yet. So um, if we look in PSC package JSON, well, first of all, so PSC package JSON is the configuration file that it created for my project, right? Uh, if I open that up, it looks like this, right? So it has a name, 
it has a package set, which it, it tried to guess based on my compiler, but you know, in this case, it messed it up because I don't have that package set. But I can just go in and you know, modify this to something that does exist. And then it has a Git repo. Um, so, so this is you know, the standard package sets repo, uh, which has all of the you know, package configurations for the various compiler versions. And then a list of dependencies, right? So we just start out with Prelude. Okay, so if I quit here, and then instead of PSC package init, because I already have the project initialized, I'm just going to say update. And it'll go and you know, resolve that Git repository and pull in um, you know, my dependencies. Right? Um, so now if I look in this uh, dot directory, dot PSC package, um, I have two directories, one for each of the package sets that tried to clone. Right? And inside the uh, 10.7 folder, we have one one directory for each of the uh, uh, you know each of the dependencies, and there's another hidden uh, dot file in here called uh, dot set, which is the actual package set itself. So this is a cloned version of the, the package set repo that we just loaded at the tag uh, for the 0.10.7 compiler release, and all of the uh, you know all the package information is in this packages.json file. Uh, oops. Uh, so this is just like a massive JSON file that contains information about all of the packages that I'm known to build with 0.10.7 uh, and uh, the tags that we should pull in order to try and build them. So nothing particularly clever here, just, you know, big pile of dependencies. But it's, uh, it's important to note that that's quite different than Bower, right? Because Bower, you just have like one huge bucket of all the versions and then PSC package try, uh, it has one bucket of versions for each compiler version, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's essentially like a registry for each compiler version, but you could have your own. Uh, you could create your own tags of the package set as well. So I'll I'll go into all that in a sec. Um, sure. I'll just I'll just get through this quick demo and then you know we'll see. All right. So so we saw PSC package in it. We saw PSC package uh, update, and then if you want to install something new, uh, you can just say PSC package install, and then you know the short name of the package. So like free for example. Um, so if I do, I'll do something quick. Uh, I'll do uh, I'll do PSCI support so that we can just show the, the REPL feature as well. Um, so you run it like this, and then it will sort of figure out all of the dependencies it needs, you know, including transitive dependencies, and it'll pull them in. So I get four, even though I only asked to install one thing. Um, and it tells us that the config file was updated, so we can go in here and you know verify that this got added. Um, and now uh, let's go over here. Uh, we already saw update, right? So if you if you change the config file and then run update, that's like about update. It just goes in and pulls the repos that it needs. Um, and then when you want to build your project, you can just say PSC package build. And that's just going to run the compiler. <coughs> um, and it'll try and pull in source files if you have any. Otherwise, it's just going to pull in you know stuff from the package set that it that it cloned. Um, and then you know because we did. Uh, PSC, uh, PSC ID supports as a dependency, we can now say PSC package REPL as well. Uh, and it'll just drop us straight into a PSCI session. Okay. Uh, so now I can say import prelude, one plus two, and this just works, you know, like you'd expect. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's pretty much about it for the basic features. There's a, there's a few more features that I'll go over. Um, that are sort of uh, useful in certain circumstances, but you know those are the ones you use more free, most frequently, right? Um, there's PSC package available, which just basically shows you everything that's in the package set. So you could use that for you know these things are usually useful for scripts, right? So here's all the packages in the package set that you could pull in if you wanted to. Uh, you can say PSC package dependencies, um, and this just shows you all of your transitive dependencies, right? So if I pull in something like uh, I don't know, validation maybe. Then it'll pull in eight packages, and then when I say PSC package dependencies, it should show me like eight or 10 or something. Yeah, okay, so we got about eight things. Um, and this is useful if, the, the goal of this was to make it simpler to uh, generate configuration files, or like, um, you know, maybe we could maybe we could uh, pipe this into like bar install or something, uh, or, or create a bar JSON file or something from these, right? Or freeze the dependencies this way. Um, so these things, like I said, these things are meant to be useful for scripts, right? Um, PSC package sources. Uh, 
basically just gives you a list of all of the uh, source paths for any packages that are currently being used, right? So this isn't necessarily all of the packages that you have under the, the PSC package directory, this one. Right? It might be that you have some that you're not currently using or some that are for older compiler versions or things like this. So it goes through and it tries to figure out which ones are actually necessary. Um, and then it gives you just those. So you could, uh, let's see, I think you could say something like, uh, hers, I'll probably get this wrong. Uh, I can pass these to hers docs maybe. Oh, uh, not quite. But this is the idea, right? You can, you can sort of pass, uh, I kind of want to figure this out now, sorry. Um, let's see. Okay, so pose docs takes a list of hashes. Maybe I need to quote something. No. Oh, doc gen. Okay. So I had data.validation. No. Uh, Obviously, I've messed something up, but you, you get the idea, right? The idea is that you should be able to pipe the output of this thing into existing commands and, you know, uh, things that take source directories as input and uh, do useful things with that. Um, maybe I need to use, like, XARG or something. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, and then finally, uninstall, you know, you can use to just remove something from the package directory um, to get rid of a package you don't need anymore. Um, so, yeah, that, that's about it. So, uh, just to go over this package sets idea real quick. So, um, you know, the question is how, how does PSC package know which package versions to use? Um, and the answer is it all depends on that big JSON file, uh, you know, that I went, that I showed before, right? Is this, uh, set, right, this file, right? This is the file that uh, tells PSC package which versions to use. So if I say PSC package install ace, um, it will go and clone this tag, you know, version three of this repository. Um, and it'll also sort of traverse all of these dependencies. So these are the transitive dependencies, right? So it'll also, also install all of these. So it'll go and find these, it'll go find arrays in here and find out what version it, it needs of arrays and install that as well. And the same for all of the others here. Right? So, you know, this is, this represents like a lot of, you know, work by a lot of people, right? So sort of get this file in this format. So you think this is sort of, you know, you know, an impossibly large amount of work, right? But um, the nice thing is, you know, you start with the, um, this actually wasn't too, too bad at all, right? You start with the, the, the things with no dependencies, like, uh, I don't know, like Prelude or something, right? Um, and those are easy to add. And then, you know, you go through and for each one, you just, uh, you can use PSC package to figure out uh, how to build the thing, uh, get a list of dependencies with PSC package dependencies and just sort of paste it in here. Um, and I, I'd like to add a command to PSC package to basically just dump one of these sections onto the console so that you could just make a pull request very, very quickly, right? So you can use PSC package to figure out what you need here, run a command, and then just make a pull request to add this thing in. Um, you know, if you start at the, if you start with the simpler packages and just work your way up, it, it's actually not too bad at all. And then after that, it's just a case of, you know, making sure you, you update packages update versions as new versions become available, right? So if, if somebody makes a minor release, um, it should technically be safe to just modify the version number here. If somebody makes a major release, you can modify it, test it locally, um, and make sure, you know, make sure it works and then, then push, a, push a change to the package set repo. Okay, so I already showed PSC package JSON. Um, Okay, yeah, so as I say, package set is just a mapping from package names to three things. It's the Git repository and the tag, which is the version we want to pull, um, and a transitive, uh, you know, a transitive, a list of transitive dependencies for that package so that, you know, um, GSE package doesn't have to go traversing the, the graph for every dependency. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so package sets are stored in Git repositories. That was this, uh, this Git repo here. Um, there's nothing particularly special about this Git repo. The only thing that matters is that it contains a packages.json file, which is the one I was showing. Um, you could just as easily point this at a private Git repo if you were, for example, a company using PureScript and you, want, you had internal packages on your own Git server, for example. Um, and, you know, say you sort of having to set up a Bower registry or something, which might be a bit more work. I'm not sure I've not done it, but, um, you know, this is relatively simple, right? We just have one JSON file. And reference it, you know, with a Git URL. 
Um, and then, you know, there are package set repositories for, you know, Pure 11 and uh, the Erlang backend as well, right? So if you want to use those, you can just switch out the package set URL and you're good to go. And many of the dependencies exist in those package sets with, you know, pointing to the appropriate uh, fork of, you know, of the repos. So, you know, this is nice and lightweight and it's pretty useful. Um, there's a couple of tools for maintainers. If you, uh, if you want to help maintain the package set, then these two commands are pretty useful. You can say, uh, PSC package updates. <coughs> um, and that will go through, you know, there's 150 packages in the set right now. So it takes a while, but um, it goes through and it just basically checks, you know, the Git tags. So AF has a new minor release, for example. Um, these are all minor releases. And occasionally it'll say, here we go, right? So uh, the day library. Uh, has a new major release. So now you can say, uh, I think help works here. Yeah, okay. So you can say apply, um, and that will go through. And every time it would say uh, new minor release, it will actually just update the local package set. If it's uh, if it's a minor release, like I said, those should always be saved. Right? Um, and then you can say apply breaking, and that will apply all of the updates, including the major ones. So then, you know, you have to be a little more cautious then as I check that things didn't break, right? And hopefully using continuous integration to, to help out there. Um, but you know, this, this can be kind of useful for um, making sure the package set you know, stays up to date and doesn't break. <coughs> and then the other, uh, the other tool is uh, PSC package verify sets. So this one again takes a while, and this one is actually used in the continuous integration job for the, uh, the package set repo. And it just goes through and just clones every, uh, every version of every repo that we have in the package set and then just tries to build them all in order. Um, and if any of them fail, then you know, the, the task fails and that causes continuous integrations to fail. Right, so, uh, let's see package 0, 10, 7. Uh, and as you can see in here, you know, it just started cloning all of these things. It would have just, if you leave it to go out to clone them all and build them all. Okay, so, you know, this is a nice approach depending on your workflow, but it doesn't work for everything, right? It's, it's not meant to. Um, specifically, it doesn't do any constraint solving. So one of the nice things about Barrow is that you can just say, you know, here are the 20 packages I would like. Uh, I don't care to give you any version information, but please go and figure it out. And it might succeed, and it might not succeed. But if it fails, it'll probably give you some, you know, relatively useful information to help you figure out what, what version was wrong, right? Which packages were incompatible. Um, PSC package doesn't do any of that. Right? So it, it crucially relies on all of the work being done up front by somebody, right? Um, but the nice thing is once you, uh, you know, if, if you have already done the work to create the package set, then uh, you don't have to do any additional work. You just, uh, you know, you know that every time you ask for ACE, for example, it'll always pull in the same dependencies and it's always going to work. Um, save people like deleting tags, but uh, I'm not worried about that right now. It might become an issue eventually. Um, and then, you know, the other caveat is that you can't customize package versions. So in Barry, you can always say, um, you know, I, I'm going to just point, instead of using the standard uh, PureScript canvas or something, right, I'm going to just point this at my local fork of PureScript canvas. Um, you can't do that easily with PSC package. The way you'd have to do that is to go into, you know, the .set directory and modify the package's JSON file uh, yourself. So you can do it, but it's more work. Um, but the, the way I'd like to encourage people to do things like that is to actually um, either fork the package set if it's for private use or for use inside a company or something like that, or to, uh, uh, you know, contribute the work back to the actual package set. So to make a, you know, if a library goes out of date or something, make a fork uh, and point the package set at the, the maintained fork. Um, so like I say, it's not, it's not ideal for all workflows, but it's, it's useful for a lot of the simpler workflows and it can, uh, the nice trade-off is that, you know, for beginners, I think it's, it's a lot quicker to get started and you don't have to worry about installing Bower and all these things. Um, okay, here we go. So, uh, contributing, if anybody's interested in contributing, there's a lot of ways to help out with PSC package. Um, one of the main ones would be to just help maintain the package set and to go through and look for script packages that are maintained but not in the set and add them with the pull request. Um, Next, if, if anybody wants to just try it out and actually start using it for development and, and report bugs as they see them or feature requests, that would be awesome. Uh, there's lots of, well, there's not very much documentation right now, but there's lots we could write. Uh, there's bits and pieces like in the README, uh, but it'd be nice to have, you know, proper guides and, uh, you know, tutorials with this stuff as well. 
And then, you know, obviously contributing to PSC package itself would be great. Uh, it's a simple Haskell project. It has almost no dependencies. It's just basically a shell, you know, it's a glorified shell script that uses the Tesla library to, you know, shell out to Git and various things. Um, and the code's pretty straightforward. So, uh, you know, I'd appreciate any help and there's lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of stuff to do. So um, let me know if you're interested. Uh, and in particular, you know, these are the things that I'm, I would like to get done eventually. So uh, there's a couple of uh, tools. You know, there's a few tools here that we have in the compiler that aren't integrated with PSC package. So uh, publish. I did some work on the compiler recently to make it easier to integrate with this. Uh, so you could, you know, publish things to pursue uh, that used, uh, you know, PSC package locally for managing dependencies. Uh, the docs tool and the bundle tool, for example, uh, I would like eventually for Pursuit uh, and the type search specifically inside Pursuit to be able to use a package set to figure out which dependencies to load. Uh, because then, you know, if we know, because, of, because a package set is, is known to, you know, be sort of internally consistent and everything builds relative to everything else in the package set, that means that we can sort of pre-compile all of those dependencies and then use the, the build artifacts to do things like type search in a much more accurate way than we can do it right now. Um, and the same with TriPure script, right? So TriPure script right now just has a sort of a, an ad hoc uh, collection of packages that I use to, de to deploy the server. It'd be really nice if we could sort of capture, um, for each of the servers that we have for the TriPure script, it'd be nice to sort of capture the packages that I use to build that server as a package set. And then, you know, hopefully we can do things like type search for TriPure script as well. Um, so I've done a little work on that and it just needs, you know, it needs a little bit more to finish it off. Um, and then there's some sort of practical things as well, like, uh, you know, you probably saw it was taking a while here to update these repos, right? And it's it's not ideal because if, I, uh, if I've already cloned it, you know, for, for it on this machine once, right, it's the same tag, it's not going to change. Um, I should just be able to cache that somewhere globally and reuse it. Uh, but it doesn't do that right now. So, it, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty slow uh, when it has to do these jobs like cloning 150 repos. Uh, so it's something that's relatively straightforward. Uh, if you wanted to contribute, would be to uh, add caching for cloned repos. Um, and that's all I have. So, uh, any questions? Otherwise, we can move on to the point 11 stuff. That was, that was really awesome. Thanks a lot for showing all that stuff. Yeah, yeah nice. No I just have a question about uh, deprecating then uh, pulp and, and uh, using Bower. Is there a plan, or can we just continue to use uh, pulp and Bower like we have? So far, so uh, there's there's no plans to deprecate anything, right? Like, so um, the, the the point is that these are supposed to be useful for different workflows, okay? Or different backends, and and pulp is you know pulp's a great tool, right? I, I use pulp for a lot of things. Uh, oh. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, it's, uh, yeah, nothing's nothing's getting deprecated. Just uh, there, there might be sort of um, we might add features to pulp to support PSC package files or vice versa, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there might be more integrations. That's okay. right. Thank you. Sure. I think PC package is uh, especially well suited when you're building an application and you're only managing your own dependencies, basically. You don't have to worry about upstream dependencies as much or maintaining backwards compatibility or something. Yeah, so there's there's like more there's a clearer motivation for it when you're doing application development. I agree, and there's a sort of um, interesting thing where you know when you're doing open source package development, it sort of crucially relies on everyone uh, contributing, right? Or like everybody has to sort of pick up work for everybody else and take their packages and include them in the sets or something. Um, so it's, it it sort of relies on this collective effort to to produce the package set. Like if you were doing this for a company, you know you'd have to make the package set, right? So it's, you know. There's a good reason to do it, but um, yeah, if we have this, if we have this standard sort of package set for every compiler release, it sort of crucially relies on everybody keeping it up to date with their packages, right? But the nice thing is, you know, if they don't, it's not going to break. It's just going to, you know, not have the latest packages. So at some point, somebody's going to be forced to do the work if they want to include some package, right, and some dependency isn't that. All right, so all good? Yeah, I think so. All right, cool.
Zero point eleven stuff then? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I'll take over then. Um, let me see if I can share. Um, I didn't do a lot of uh, like practicing of all this stuff, but um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I got because all the stuff since uh, our last demonstration. Let me see if I can pull up the Pure Script uh, releases page. That's a few tabs. Tab man. Oh, this is a lot less than it was yesterday. I cleaned up. Um, since our last uh, one, I think it was dot zero dot or ten three um, was not included in our last uh, demonstration of PSC features. Um, yeah, so like zero ten three, zero ten four, zero ten five. Uh, six and seven. Like, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of releases. So there's a lot of stuff to cover. And in addition to this, there's a uh, upcoming release, zero eleven, which has a whole bunch of stuff. Like, in addition to this, and there's like a few breaking changes in zero eleven two. I think I'm not too familiar about those, um, but I've experienced a few of them. Um, yeah. So I've so I've, I've uh, started working on how to uh, um, organize all these. There's quite a quite a few things here. I I, I have a few demos for. Uh, a few of the more interesting features, um, but um, a lot of them I don't have uh, a lot to talk about. Um, right. So, if you want to get started, if you want to test a lot of like the stuff that's in zero to eleven, but uh, not released yet, then you have to build from build pure script from source. So uh, you can do that by just like cloning cloning the repo. Um, Let's see, stack build, and then you just wait for that to finish. Um, yeah, and then you just add the add the stuff to the path. I'm not a pro at the stack stuff, so I had to do some like directory hacking. Yeah, um, but then like yeah, so like one of the biggest changes. Let me get to a terminal here. Is uh, it's now purse <laughs> instead of PSC. Um, yeah. So, um, and then each of the, so this is one unified executable. Um, so you have purse build, purse, or not build, uh, purse, purse compile, and then purse IDE server and IDE client. Those are all in single executable. And purse REPL instead of uh, PSC I, that's changed to purse REPL. So this is a pretty big uh, noticeable thing. Um, and there's no backwards compatibility. So if you install 0.11, like you, you, there's no uh, wrapper around like a PSC uh, to call the purse build or purse compile. Um, not that I not that I know of. Um, it'd be kind of nice for new users until like this new command is deprecated. But uh, th there is one actually. It's in um, it's in the scripts folder in the. Uh, in the compiler repo, so if you if you build it with the bundle tool, like you know the one that's going to build those bundles right there, um, it'll actually come with those scripts and put them on the path. Um, but oh. you have to just do one in the right there, yeah. And they do like almost nothing, right? But right. They exist, yeah. Right. So, but, but the, the, this will ensure that uh, tools like uh, like IDE plugins and Pulp, they'll still be able to use the new executable using the old. old yeah. So I, I use Pulp by using those, for example. Awesome. That's that's great news. Um, okay, so if we, if we want to use that, um, we would just add this to the path. But I I think that'll be later yeah, exactly. when you do packaging and the full release. It's not too mm -hmm. important to cover right now. Um, right. So that's that. Yeah, that, that that's one noticeable thing in the zero to eleven thing. Uh, single consolidated executable. Um, yeah, and then we'll get into some pretty awesome features. In my opinion, of uh, in the zero to eleven, um, I think some of these are available in zero ten, like three, four, five, six, seven. Um, but I'll just include all of them in uh, as part of the zero eleven release uh, presentation. But yeah, advanced pattern guards. Um, let's see, do I have a code for that? Pattern guards, right. So right now, if you're doing uh, pure script coding, and you can you can do pattern matching in different places, like maybe the case expression or uh, on the on the function level, 
So there's a function that takes two arguments and produces the, out, uh, produces the thing. And you can do the, this guard syntax. So in, if n is less than m, then produce the n. Um, and you can do this otherwise syntax, produce the m. And yeah, it, it, works, uh, yeah, it works like you'd expect. Um, but there's a, mm, right, uh, but you can't do a lot of advanced things. I think there's a, a Haskell extension called paddle gu uh, pattern guards that allows you to do some even cooler things. Um, like if you want to call, so here's a different function. You can call a function in the pattern guard and then bind it to a variable and then use that variable for deciding what the output should be. Um, uh, Yes, like, and then you can do some other uh, advanced things, uh, right? I, th I think there's also some improvements in how you can do your white spacing, your indentation, for the pattern guards. Um, so so I, I use this sometimes, um, and where it's really useful actually is I don't know if you have an example for this. Sorry if you do, but uh, uh, no, what you have is the X there can be like an arbitrary binder, right? So you could say something like, if you have an array, you can say uncons the array. And then condition on the uncons being a just of a head and a tail. Um, you see, so you could have like just head tail on the left of the arrow there. Um, so that's like saying only hit, only use this case if the array is not empty. But pattern maps the head and the tail simultaneously if it is. Yeah, and you could use that same thing for maybe's too, right? Right. So um, it's, it's, so it's really useful for writing passes too. Sorry, go ahead. So if, if that's a maybe int, you could do a reverse pattern matching on this a variable. Like this? Yeah, exactly. That's pretty neat. Um, and then that's, I'm wondering if this is all separate code because the next thing I want to talk about was pattern matching and let clauses. And th this seems to be like a functionality overlap with the pattern matching and let clauses. Um, let. Um, let's see. But yeah, like right, right, right here. If you have a data type, a simple wrapper around an int, uh, you can unwrap it in a let clause, um, and then yeah. So you don't. So like you don't have to do uh, case uh, a of, and then do your pattern matching in the case expression. Like before this, you had to do this this sort of pattern matching, uh, but. Now you can do pattern matching right in the let expressions. And that's uh, similar to what uh, we were just seeing in the pattern guards. You can pattern match out of, the, out of these binders in the pattern guard. Um, and now you can do the same thing in let expressions, which I think is really pretty huge. Because there's been many times where I've not used a let expression. I just kind of wrap everything inside of a case expression to pattern match out of a constructor. So it's pretty huge. Um, and then you can do some, like ignore some values of uh, these multi-parameter types. Um, you can do the same thing with arrays. Uh, if you have an array of two elements, you can pattern match to get the first two elements. So this is pretty like life-changing features in my opinion for pure script developers. Um, we're pretty important to raise awareness of this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's all I've got to say about mm -hmm. that one, unless anybody else has something to talk about about that feature. <clears throat> and then there's, uh, this one's a pretty interesting one. Because this is one of the breaking changes in 0 to 11. Uh, there's some concern about uh, throwing, like throwing away values in do blocks. Um, so there's there's a suggestion to fix that by um, forcing you to bind it to an empty. Uh, I'm not sure what, what you call that. Um, I don't know if I have an, ex an example for that. How is this called? implicitly discarded values to discard class. Oh, I don't have an example of that. 
Um, right. Like, yeah, I'm not sure exactly uh, how to explain this one. Uh, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, here, here, here's the example I had. So if you have a do block with, uh, for for this, you have to start using this sort of syntax. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's all I can say about that. Sorry about that. Um, then this is the this is another really cool feature in zero to eleven is symbols type level symbols. Um, right. So, so oh, excuse me. So in symbols, you can like if you have a, a uh, hmm, uh, right, right, right down. You know, let's see. So if you have a data type uh, example, then you can like this is one data type. And this is a different data type. And here's yet another unique type that. Um, right, because yeah, because these are symbols. Um, and each, uh, and so, so like symbols let you use strings in type signatures. And each string is parsed as a uh, unique type. Um, so if you want to put a string in a type signature, uh, you can use uh, like a, like a proxy type um, to put a the world string in the type, and then at the value level, you uh, you just you can use the proxy, and then to get the string out of the type, uh, which is useful in uh, some error messages or other places, you can use a reflect symbol, and uh, this will. Uh, uh, ch ch change the value into uh, so this little parse as well. Uh, hello world. Um, and then uh, some uh, interesting like I, like I'm 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 always been keen on trying to write types around uh, like writing SQL queries. So you could like write some code like this where you just do a type synonym of this table an S proxy, um, and you can make a value called asset table. Um, and then you can write functions for querying just the asset table. Um, or, yeah, I'm pretty terrible at explaining this stuff, but uh, uh, right. And then I also have this uh, use this different name called like ref, like ref and deref, uh, and that's kind of like what's happening. Like you can store a reference to a, a, type a type level symbol, and then you can deref that using the reflect symbol function to get uh, uh, like that, the symbol from the type back into the value level. Um, yeah, so I think this is really powerful stuff, and this is being used a little bit in uh, like the hyper. I saw that there's a library on GitHub uh, by Frigo about th that's doing this very similar thing, d describing uh, SQL tables and it's their associated fields um, for like the PureScript love field library. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that's being that's happening because of the symbol support. Um, right, yeah. So symbols. Uh, and then there's deriving functor. Um, so that, that's a new thing that you can derive. Previously, you could derive ord, eek, uh, some other things. We have a list of the ones in the documentation repo. Generic and new type for one? Right, yeah, generic and new type. I wonder if I can find it. Looks like it hasn't been merged yet. Um, right, and user-defined kinds. Uh, I, I didn't have time to parse into this to learn exactly how this works, um, but that syntax, if, if, if you know how to use uh, your own kind of kinds, you can do foreign 
import kind, I believe, and you give it a name, like uh, bool maybe. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what the, you put on the right side here. Um, but right, um, yeah, so the, the, like this, this, this will be available in like uh, some of the latest PureScript versions. Um, and user-defined warnings, uh, you can write some code like this where you can add a, uh, uh, this uh, type class constraint with, with a, a string in the type. And this is enabled using the symbols. Um, and, that, and then every time that this, uh, uh, I think, is compiled, then, then this will um, appear in some, some places. Yeah. Um, and then there's the source maps, as we received uh, quite a bit of attention in the last few releases. Um, actually, making the source maps uh, all the way back to the peer subcode is a little bit of uh, jumping through some hoops. Um, because, right, and in order to do that, you have to use the uh, sorcery thing to glue uh, source maps from each uh, step of compil compilation. So compiling from peer script to uh, like the, the stuff in the output directory, like that, that will put source maps in the output directory. And then when you use PSC bundle to bundle from the output directory into a single, uh, into a single file, then um, that will make some new source maps. And then using uh, Browserify to again bundle the PSC bundle into something that's ready for the browser, that will make yet a new set of source maps. Um, so then gluing each of these source maps together and each in each of these compilation steps can be done using uh, this sorcery. Um, I'm not sure if I have Um, yeah, I'm, qu I'm quite afraid to actually go through and try all this, but it's worth a try. Um, so this is with the old uh, PSC. It's going to do purse compile, um, and then I'm actually using PSC package in this repository in this uh, directory, so we can do PSC package sources. I believe. And then we can request the source maps. Um, we need to remove what's in the output directory right now. Got quite a few uh, packages in here. Um, And we'll just pick one of the, and we can see that there's this map. And like that itself isn't too exciting. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how the syntax of the, these mapping files work. Uh, Don't look at the protocol, it's horrible. <laughs> Have you looked at it? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid of it too. Um, right. So that's uh, using PSC, and then PSC bundle, you can uh, do a similar thing. Well, I have to do, here's the happy path. Um, I think there's a purse command for bundle. And then I'll put this in, t we start from the main slash index.js, and then we output it into this bundle thing, the output directory, the main modules, and ask for source maps. And I'll see if that worked. Did, I think. Yeah, there's a map there. Okay. Um, oops. And then we have to do the browserify. Um, I'm not sure if we have to have the output in our path in browserify. I've already installed browserify in this directory, so I just want to put this in the top level app dot bundle, and we'll take that uh, PSC bundle that we made before, and this dash dash debug flag on browserify will 
pass. We'll have it make some source maps. Um, and it looks like a lot of the source maps are in line at the very bottom of this uh, file. But that's that. Um, so let me see if we can open up in the browser, because that's my ultimate goal here, is to be able to open up in the browser and see pure script code. I think we're, uh, we, we still have to do the sorcery business, um, but I want to see what we get if 8,000, if we don't do the sorcery business. It's in the console. I don't have any UI for this. And we look at the sources. Um, and here's our app dot bundle. And then these italic italicized files are requested by the browser when it sees that this initial source file has source maps. And it says it detects these source maps. Um, So here's the output directory. And you can see that uh, here's what PSC bundle made. Um, but this still is not pure script code. And so I, like in, initially it's like, oh my gosh, everything's too complicated, let's give up. But luckily, uh, I think it was uh, Ann Wolverson had done a lot of uh, work on this. And he discovered that the sorcery tool uh, can be used to glue source maps together. So we just point it to where the top level source map is. And then I believe sor uh, sorcery will go through each of the, it'll go backwards because uh, each of these source maps has links to the previous code and that code has links to its previous code um, and such. Um, so I'm not sure. So then that outputs this app.bundle.js.map. Um, and then I think if we reload this in the browser, we can see pure script code. We have the source directory, which matches uh, our source. And we also have the output directory, which we have before. But now the source directory. So we should, we should be able to see some pure script code in here. Try to set a breakpoint. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet. I'm afraid of failure. Um, oh, good. Here it is. I just scroll up. Um, breakpoints. I don't think breakpoints. I don't have enough code here to do breakpoints. So some breakpoints should work at least. I'm not sure with uh, this particular set of um, of tools, but at, at least if you've got a do notation, you might have a chance. Mm -hmm. I think it stopped, didn't it? Yeah, it's no, it's it stopped here. It's um, paused, yeah. I'm not sure what's like like the, like there are, there is some stuff in scope here. I think you may be on the definition of main rather than actually running main. Right, it didn't run main oh, yeah. on the definition of it. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what happens if we step over. This is pretty, like even getting this far, I think is really amazing. Like I, like I never dreamed that there, this possible to get the pure script code in the browser. Um, Cause like all, all naive attempts of using source maps just show the output directory. Um, right, so that's that. Um, yeah, so source maps. Thanks a lot for uh, all your work on that. Um, then moving on, the nested record updates, uh, I think is also pretty huge. Nested record updates. Right, so if you start with a pure script record, um, and then ha and it's like, uh, this is like information about me, like my name, age, location, address, city. The point here is that it's records inside of records inside of records. So if our task is to like change my city, if I move towns, uh, like previously in pure script, we would have to, we can do, we can do that re relatively easily, so like here's me in a different town. We would take the me record and we can use record update syntax 
Uh, but then in order to change the city, we have to traverse like kind of all the way down here. So we have to do, we set the me loca so we set location to a new me location where that location has been updated and its address updates, you know, me location address is address. And then all the types match up so that this works out. But uh, it's kind of a pain because you have to reference like the original record like quite a few times. Um, but with this new this new feature is we only have to reference me once, and then for each child property inside this me record, we update we, we just reference the property and use the record update syntax uh, in each child going all the way down. Um, yeah, so that's uh, I think it's pretty amazing. I wonder if I can use purse purse repl. And then here's using the syntax for PSC package. You can use the back ticks like uh, Phil was trying to do earlier. Um, and I think we can import, what did I call this module? Nested record updates. And at the bottom is the main function. And you can see that all this compiles and works pretty well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really thrilled about that one too. Lots of features to be thrilled about in this uh, release. Um, and then there's been some enhancements. I'm not sure about all the details about these, but there's been some bugs with uh, uh, using rows and instance heads. So we're going to derive an instance of uh, show. Uh, I think, right, right, right. And then there's also a bug with uh, der deriving generic. Uh, of type, type synonyms like like this too. Um, right. Um, and then uh, typed binders ha has some new features. And then PSC has uh, some, new, or IDE has some new features coming in uh, too. Like there's a polling option for Windows users, I believe, so that uh, it, it can watch as files change. Because Unix has a uh, file system events that you can attach to, but Windows does not, so you have to do like manually ask the files every once in a while. I believe that's how it works, Chris. Um, and then Chris also was working on some record completions that uh, IDEs can tie into. So if you have a variable that's a record and you do, uh, let me see if I can type some code for. So if you're doing like, me three dot, uh, and then after this is one of these properties in uh, here, like name, age, location. So it'd be nice to be able to get uh, oops, uh, completion for the stuff after the dot. And I think Chris has been making some really big progress on this. So uh, I think, I haven't tried that myself yet. I don't think PSC IDE Vim has uh, tied into that feature yet, but uh, that's, I'm pretty excited for that because that's uh, upcoming too. Um, and then op like better operator support, uh, at least PSC IDE Vim, which I use, uh, you can't automatically import operators. Uh, so like having that support is pretty big too. And then there's been some performance improvements there. Uh, and then of course there's performance improvements in the PSC uh, library too. Uh, parsing stuff has a different uh, Haskell type uh, support for um, more UTF code points in different places, uh, error messages are improved. And then another interesting one is um, inlining unsafe partial. Uh, I think I think inlining things is gonna happen to more functions in the future too. Um, so if you use unsafe partial, uh, if you look at the generated code, let me put output slash Look at the, there's, no, there's no mention here about that unsafe uh, partial because that's just been inlined, inlined away, as they say. Yeah, so that's, that's all pretty, pretty great stuff. Um, right, and uh, in Phil's talk on PSC package, um, he, said he, he said he made some changes to the PureScript compiler. So that you can do uh, PC package docs, I think, and I, th I think that command might have had some hard dependencies on Bower executable, perhaps. 
Um, but yeah, there's some work towards removing and hard dependency on Bauer. Um, yeah, so that's like all, 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 all the stuff I've got to show. Sorry, it wasn't more organized and you know, enthralling, but uh, 